Noah, thank you. Hey, Irene, how are you? Some time. So good to see you. You too. You too. Everybody's safe at home, I suppose. Yes, we're all we're all here and all safe. And yet <laughs> working. Yeah, we're still working. <laughs> yeah. Well, thanks. We're doing virtually Crossville. We're bringing some really good information to folks that they would have perhaps gotten at the trade shows. Okay. Um, but now we're bringing it online. Okay. And there are some really important topics that are at the forefront for the tile industry, and you are our guru. And okay. I don't I don't use that term lightly. You I have earned you. guru. <laughs> <laughs> so first things first, I know there is a new building code update that, and I'm reading here, designers have more flexibility to use large exterior adhered porcelain tile. This sounds yeah. really cool, so please talk us through what that really means. Okay. Um, so the, converse, the conversation started probably three or four years ago. So what happened in the tile industry was, I think in 2010, um, there became language in the building code that singled out porcelain tile as an adhered veneer and, and put a size limitation to it. Um, prior to that, we were included, I think, in what was considered um, exterior adhered masonry veneer, and it gave us a size of about five square feet with no side over 36 inches. When the code changed um, for this, for whatever reason, um, it limited us to three square feet with no side over 24 inches. Um, and this was prior to porcelain tile panels too. So the code cycle only happens once every three years. Um, the code actually changed. So if you want to affect a, a coming code cycle, you've really got to start three or four years um, to kind of get your ducks in a row. Mm -hmm. So we started talking about this and we said, you know, it'd be nice if we could address panels and it'd be nice if we could address, you know, what seems to be outdated size limitations based on, you know, how good setting materials have gotten and how and what innovation is. Um, so really the, 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 so what you have to do is you have to go to a code hearing and you have to make your case for a change in language. Um, but it's a pretty... Um, time-consuming you know, process because you actually have to come up with alternatives if they don't like your first you know submission and there's hundreds and hundreds of submissions so oh, I, bet. Um, yeah. I actually I actually went to support tile council in the effort so the, the effort was led by tile council and the International Masonry Institute um, IMI um, but a few of us went also uh, Jim went from, from a pay and myself went to just kind of support Jim actually talked um, but you're waiting. Uh, we waited a day and a half for our five minutes to get up and speak. Oh um, and you have to be really concise and that kind of thing. So where were you on the, was that in DC or? That was in Albuquerque. Okay. Um, they just, I think, I think it moves. I think the, the, you know, the code hearings move from place to place. Cause, um, I don't remember, uh, October was somewhere else, Las Vegas, I think, when we were at Total Solutions. Um, so the, the steps in the process are you go to the main meeting in Albuquerque, you present your case, you present your language, um, and then after that, you see what, what votes you got. And we actually got, I think there were 12 members on the committee, 12 or 14, and we got a unanimous yes um, at the committee. So that was the first sign that, you know, that we were going to be okay. But then you have to go through a long public comment period. And if you get public comments against your submission, um, then you have to address those. So that period actually ended when we were at Total Solutions. Mm -hmm. um, and we didn't get any public comments, so it went past that. So it was actually just last in the last week or two where it was final confirmation of the change um, to the building code. Wow. So, yeah. So it'll go into the 2021 general building code um, and it'll change two things really was our submission. One was there was a chart that said, what is the minimum thickness of tile that's direct bonded to the outside of a building? And it was listed at a quarter inch. But because of panels, we really wanted to see that at an eighth of an inch because we have the thinnest three millimeter panels. Mm -hmm. So that change went through. And then a change on um the tile size itself okay yeah okay um okay so we changed so we changed the minimum thickness thing um and then we changed the size limitation for the tile um so the so what it gave us was we separated tile between things that were under three and a half pounds per square foot because we figured that was the maximum th uh weight of a panel and then so under and over three and a half pounds per square foot 
So for thicker traditional tiles, which were about, are about five pounds per square foot, mm -hmm. um, we got the change from three square feet with no side over 24 inches to nine square feet um, with no side over 48 inches. So okay. it would now allow a 24 by 48 or even a little bit bigger um, to be direct bonded to the outside of a building. Because all of this is without mechanical fastening. How big of a piece of tile are you able to stick on the side of a building with just you know thin set and move with joints um, and be adhered. So we got from three square feet to nine square feet for regular tile. Um, and then panels weren't really addressed at all. So for things under three and a half pounds per square foot, because they weigh much less, like our three millimeter panel only weighs 1.7 pounds per square foot. Mm -hmm. We actually got that size changed to 17 and a half square feet. Wow. Um, so for us, it's a half panel of our, you know, one meter by three meter, which comes out at like 16 something square foot. So um, we can very easily use a modular size out of our panel to maximize what we can do with that with very little waste. Um, and then we looked at larger panels and, you know, might, might be a third of a five by 10 or a quarter of something bigger, something yeah. like that. So, okay. yeah, go ahead. Yeah, in practical application, pun intended, yeah. Um, what does this mean for folks? What so it, it means it means two things. So the complicated thing really is IBC, the International Building Code, changes um, in 2021. This language will become there. But every single municipality slash state slash, you know, whatever, um, then adopts. So there's a California building code, a Florida building code, a North Carolina. And what they do is they take the, either the building code as a whole and adopt it, or the parts that are applicable to them, or they might add a little bit. Like in California, they might need to add some seismic, and in Florida, they might need to add some hurricane-related information. Mm -hmm. um, so it'll still be a while before we see that language go into local municipalities and state building codes. But in the interim, what we can do is when we go to, so like right now, let's say the, I don't know, the Oklahoma building code still says the biggest tile we can put is three square feet on the side of a building. Before, what we would have done is go to the building official and say, hey, we'd like to submit an alternate and we'd like you to allow this larger size tile because this talked about big heavy things not being okay on the side, but we have these lighter weight products. So could you allow a larger size? Right. So that was an argument you were making one off, you know, case by case basis to each individual building inspector and, you know, may or may not be successful with that. Sure. Now, if we could, now we can actually produce a piece of paper that says, hey, you know, this isn't just our opinion about the building code being too limited. The building code's actually changing. And because there are three-year code cycles, it won't change until this. That should, in my mind at least, make a building official feel more comfortable that they're adopting something that's not necessarily just your opinion, but is something that, you know, the code is actually evolving to uh, in, in, include. So totally. it should, you know, it should allow us, you know, because for, for me, it was ridiculous. We couldn't put a six by 36 on the outside of a one story building, you know, without these complications. Yeah. So I think it's a really big deal for the tile industry, you know, especially as we are losing some of the square footage and spaces that we've traditionally been, you know, mm -hmm. if we can capitalize on spaces where we could be, where, you know, it's harder for alternative products to, to play in that space, you know. Um, I, I think it could be a, a win for us. So awesome. for sure the change was a win and then how we capitalize on it as an industry and as a company, um, you know, is up to us. Yeah, so we're thinking ahead to 2021 on this. Yeah, so and then even, yeah, 2021 we'll have the book with the language in it. Right now we've just kind of written up the language. So if we got to approach a code official tomorrow, you know, right. we document exactly, you know, how it changed and that kind of thing so they can put that. Yeah, so it can be in the spec for something that's going to be built in 2021. It could be, in, so until 2021, and maybe even longer, right? Because I think there's some municipalities out there probably still using 2015 building code, even though the oh, wow. 2018 would have been the last um, full cycle change. Mm -hmm. So, you know, in some states or places, it might be a long time before their building code actually says this new language, but actually having the 2021 change, so there's language in a book, and even now having the documentation of the final approvals of that language 
will help us have that conversation easier, even in the interim until the language is adopted into IBC and then, you know, as it goes down the chain into state municipalities. Right. And what an interesting little insight into how building codes even happen. It was, you know, it was, a, it was a, it was a first for me, um, and it was really, it was really interesting, um, the whole process of it. So there were code consultants, and you know, there was a clock. You only got to speak for two minutes, and when you were done, you were done. And yeah. um, it was a little nerve wracking. I was really happy that I didn't have to speak. <laughs> I mean, I was ready, but I was nervous um, mm -hmm. to get up there and just not make a mistake because I oh mean, you say the wrong thing, and then you know. So Make those, uh, that teaches you to be concise. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and it also teaches you how it taught for me, it taught me how things work, right? You know, I mean, how does a bill become a law, right? I yes. mean, how does language get into building code? How do you change it, you know? Um, so for, for me, it was this really interesting process of how the kind of inner workings of our industry do. And we haven't as an industry paid enough attention in years past to building code and how it affects us. Mm -hmm. um, so I think this process may at least, you know, shine the light on a little bit how we should be paying attention you know because sometimes it's just things change if you're not there if you're not affecting oh, yeah. your own destiny you know then your destiny would be well, affected and you. look at how our our product is evolving this is so yeah. in my opinion Anyways. really necessary to oh yeah okay. yeah, yeah so, it is. we're not limited to use our product so. exactly yeah and in my years in the industry it's kind of cool to see us using tile in more creative ways and yeah. more opportunities for all of us. Yeah. So my next topic, Okay. Uh, TCNA and members collaborate on material ingredient transparency in a game changing initiative. Yeah. So Talk this one, through. yeah. Yeah. This one a little bit um, because it's still, we're still doing it you know, as opposed to it's done and I can kind of speak to where it was and what it's going to do. Um, this one, I think I'm still wrapping my head around completely, um, but we're participating in the effort. Um, so, you know, obviously I had to make the case for why we should do that. Um, so just explain so, the, the basics yeah, of it. Of the material ingredient guide? Right. For people who are not familiar at all. Okay. I, mean, I, I want to try and do it as simply as possible. Yeah. Um, so, so we do things like EPDs and HPDs and declare labels, um, and they really fall into two categories. So one is an EPD, what is your impact on the environment based on, you know, what you do as a manufacturer. Mm -hmm. The other two HPDs and declare labels are ingredient transparency. Um, so tell us about the stuff you use to make the things you make, um, and if there are any hazards associated with that. So kind of one level up from just using the information that's out there is what's called a green screen assessment, like a full toxicological review of a singular material um, and what its hazards are. Mm -hmm. So where we've been in the past is if you went, say we had 15 ingredients in our tile. If we wanted to go get a green screen assessment for each of those 15 ingredients, it might cost us $8,000 per ingredient. Wow. Then another tile manufacturer who probably uses 13 or 14 of those same ingredients goes to get that done and they have to pay $8,000 per ingredient for the exact same toxicological review because somebody else holds the database, mm -hmm. basically. You know, so even though their work got less because they already did it for you, it still holds. Yep. So, we kind of said as an industry, what if we banded together because 13 out of 15, just for just to put a number out there, of our ingredients are always the same from manufacturer to manufacturer. What if we could do our own green screen assessments and just the people who participated in the program, right? So it's not available to a whole, a whole industry. It's kind of like the industry EPD. You can only mm -hmm. capitalize on those credits if you are a named participant in that industry EPD. Right. So it'll be the same thing for this. Whoever agrees to participate in this work will have access to this database. Nice, um, yeah. Yeah. 
So that's, that's, the, that's the first idea. And then the question really is after that, now that you've had your ingredients green screen assessed, what do you do with that information? Mm -hmm. um, and that's the part that um, I'm still kind of figuring out a, a little bit. Um, I think that there's probably two things that are the usefulness of it. Um, yes. Maybe maybe two or three, at least the way I understand it now. And I think we'll be able to, you know, um, utilize it more. So, I mean, but when we saw like the Tile Council press release and it had quotes from uh, somebody at USGBC, I think, and, and somebody else in the green building community, it was really good to see that recognition for the tile industry so from people at that level. Yes. Because a lot of what we've done as a sustainability committee inside of Tower Council and a lot of the efforts has really been to make sure that the tile industry is at the forefront of what's being asked from a sustainability purpose. And if we look back 10 years ago, we weren't there. Mm -hmm. um, we, we just thought tile was the most you know, um, sustainable. Awesome. So yeah. Just figured that everybody should have, you know, recognized that too. But it doesn't work like that. If you don't participate in the, um, in in the in the work of it, then you don't really get it done. Yes. Yes. Um, so, I, I think one is just to stay in front. You know, to, as an industry, um, and then the second thing that's a little more. You know, in, so, in, in some ways I wish, you know, because we're doing these things, we get to take advantage of it as Crossville. Um, but the reality is that if you scale the program, you know, and every manufacturer is using the same information and talking the same talk when we get these questions from the, from the marketplace, that that's that that kind of rise all ships, you know, that, that scaling yes. of the tile industry out to the sustainability marketplace really is better for all of us. Um, because then we're talking the same talk and walking the same, you know, when we get to questions, we're answering them in the same way. Absolutely. So while it's good to be individual and doing maybe, you know, more than others, um, the reality is we'll get the most benefit if the tile industry itself is scaled from the, in this inside the sustainability you know community as oh well we know tile and we know what they're bringing to the table that's going to help us all in the end absolutely um, yes and then I guess the other two things are I, I think what it'll allow us to do is things like our HPD and our declare labels mm -hmm. it will kind of allow them to uh, we can upgrade them right so okay. right now they're ingredient disclosures. But if you can get ingredient disclosures with a green screen assessment, third party verified, you know, per this kind of thing. So it allows us to upgrade the information we already have. Mm -hmm. Finally, there's all there's credits in lead that are specifically called optimization. Um, and the green, uh, the material ingredient guide and its database will allow us to play in the optimization credits um, uh, easier. Okay. So that's, that's, you know. Yeah. That's, yeah that's my simplistic idea of it so far and i think as it evolves um we'll learn we'll, we'll learn more about what we can do because the reality is the green building rating systems are evolving right so you know i think our, our real effort as a sustainability committee for the industry um, is to stay ahead of the curve you right. know what is coming next how do we actually do something as an industry that allows us to say we're doing something that n people aren't even you know barely even thinking about yet you know we're going to be here we're going to be that for you um, yeah. and that allows us to stay ahead of the curve yeah in long term i mean crossville has such a solid sustainability stance um, everything yeah. just supports that very well yeah everything supports that so you know it really should just make what we have more robust um and allow us to have you know even more sustainability story um for the designers and right that are out there using our products and then a last topic and i honestly i just kind of saw a headline and while i have you here <laughs> it was just some kind of update to the epd are you familiar with what the tcna announced yeah so um so EPDs are uh, usually done every five years. Okay. Uh, and this year, 2019 was the five year, 2019 or 2020, um, might have been 2020, was the five year renewal of the industry EPD. Okay. Um, so 
it used to be in older versions of LEED, mm -hmm. you had to choose. Do you want credit if you do your own EPD as a manufacturer? Um, or do you want the credit, which was half credit, if you participated in the industry EPD? Gotcha. The new version of LEED allows you to actually um, get contribution for both. Um, more okay. credit for doing your own. Yeah. And still half credit for doing the industry, but now you can combine them and you can get credit for doing both. Oh, nice. So we participated again in the new industry EPD. Um, and that, that type of information we can use to like compare our own carbon footprint or our own global warming potential to other industries. So mm -hmm. like if the vinyl industry does an EPD, then we can look at that EPD and say, hey, you know, tiles global warming potential or its carbon footprint is less than. So it gives us another way to tell the story of tile, um, even against other finishes for those people looking for that type of information about which products to choose. So. Nice, that's great. Well, this is all really good news, you know, yeah, for the industry and for Crossville. Yeah, for sure. It is. Um, and, you know, it's just a matter of staying, staying in the front of it, you know, mm -hmm. and, and, and participating. But Tile Council has done a really good job for us pushing, you know, pushing these initiatives. Um, we're super happy with our sustainability consultant who's helping us navigate these. Mm -hmm. um, for years, we've been, I mean, as you, as you said, we've been doing these sustainability things for years. Now we're just starting to be able to put the pieces of the puzzle that we've had into a puzzle that means something. Um, and simply, you know, it, it has to be simple. It's, it's not an elevator pitch, but it's gotta be, you know, it's got to be com less complicated enough for everybody to, you know, know how to capitalize and, and utilize the information when they're talking to somebody. Yes. And that's why we're having this conversation because I, you know, I said good for the industry, good for Crossville, but that's yeah. ultimately good for anyone who sells tile or yeah, specifies it tile. It that's is. that's that, the end goal, you know. In that respect, we have to, you know, we, we hope that, you know, rising waters, you know, so. Yeah, I, I hope this helps. I hope this helps our own, yeah. our own folks and others Just kind of Real understand. quick, in light of yeah. the fact that we're recording this while uh, safe at home measures are still uh, in effect and the pandemic is in, in its thick middle, do you perceive any of this having any long term effect on how specifiers would prioritize sustainable features of tile or, you know, HPD kind of stuff. Just, just curious. Just a top line perspective. Yeah, you, you mean how the how the environment that we're living in right now with the, with the kind of pandemic, how that might actually affect what affect the specs when they specify materials and tiles advantages. Do you think those advantages will speak even more strongly in light of folks <laughs> wanting to keep environments cleaner, that kind of thing? I think there will. Um, I think there are already firms that were much more into finding the sustainable products um, that had, you know, material ingredient disclosures and EPDs and those kind of things. I think those firms will, will double down on that type of information. Um, I think, you know, one of the things that I'm looking at doing is we have generic specs that we can give um, that can be cut and paste from. I think we need to update those with more robust sustainability information. So when somebody, you know, writes a spec, they can pick a product that's green squared compliant or that has an EPD or that has HPDs and, and declare labels. Um, but we're going to have to do a little bit to push it on our side because I think okay. what's going to happen is um, people are going to ask really simplistic questions that, you know, aren't the... You know, we're going to get questions from homeowners of, well, you know, how long does the virus live on your surface, you know, or something okay. like that. Yeah, yeah. Um, we're going to have to maybe have answers to that, but be very careful. You know, I mean, we live in the United States. We have an EPA. You know, they're, they're, they're very cautious of people who are making, you know, we can do something to protect the public health. Totally, um, yeah. We have to be careful about that. But I do think it'll bring a new wave of um, asking questions about surfaces and building, building spaces that are healthy for everybody. Mm -hmm. You know, because I think that's the, the well building standard, you know, it, I think is really starting to get some traction. Um, and I think, you know, those kind of things are, you know, what are we doing for the spaces that people spend a whole lot of time in? And how do we optimize how those spaces affect people in their daily lives? I do think there'll be a bigger push for that. Mm -hmm. um, and hopefully the things that we've done already just give us a framework in order to, you know, provide a, provide a solution for those folks. Yeah. 
Well, yeah. we need to be thinking ahead on all of this, you know? Yeah, we do. You know, and we've got some, you know, <laughs> not that we, you know, not that we're not busy, but, you know, it's, it's <laughs> exactly. definitely yeah. evolving, evolving yeah. you know. Doing things frame. in the moment, but we'll be yeah. ahead of the game um, yeah. as things evolve. Well, thank you. Thank you hey, so thanks much. For, thanks for having me. Time. Hopefully hopefully it's helpful, you know, to absolutely learn about some of those new Very things. Very much so. I think we'll see a few more Tile Council press releases about stuff. So, you know, l let me know, you know. We'll, we'll talk can, again. I again. think this is not our last time. I think we're okay. on to something here. Sounds good. Okay, awesome. Thank you. All right. You have a good rest of your day. You too. Thank you. Okay.